Hello, and welcome to Lecture 2 of the Forces Unit in Phys 1104. The main goal of this lecture is to learn to draw good free body diagrams, which is a key skill for the rest of this course, and probably for many other courses that you'll take in the future. A useful piece of terminology is translational equilibrium. An object at rest is in translational equilibrium, but another possibility is an object that's moving at constant velocity. Equilibrium means no change, or things being in balance. And so an object in translational equilibrium is an object in unchanging translational motion, or in other words, constant velocity, and zero counts as constant. So we've seen that when the vector sum of forces on an object is zero, the object moves with constant velocity, or in other words, it's in translational equilibrium. But we've already seen this idea much earlier in the course in another disguise. Think of the law of inertia. As viewed from any inertial reference frame, any isolated object moves at constant velocity. Well, an isolated object is an object that isn't interacting with the environment, except we now see another possibility. If all the interactions cancel each other out, that's the same thing as not interacting with the environment. And so having a vector sum of forces that is zero acting on an object is the same thing. That's isolated. And constant velocity is the same thing as translational equilibrium. So in other words, these two laws here are just equivalent statements. They're two ways to understand the same law. One reason to understand translational equilibrium is to avoid being fooled in situations where objects aren't accelerating, even though there are many forces acting on them. And so it's good to look at what else forces can do to objects. We already know that forces can cause objects to change their velocity, or in other words, accelerate. And so that's a change in the translational motion of the object. But even when the vector sum of forces is zero, if the forces aren't lined up with each other, they can cause the object to accelerate angularly, or in other words, to change its rotational motion. Also, forces can cause objects to be deformed, which is a change in shape. So we're largely going to be concerned with how forces cause things to accelerate. We've already seen, though, changes of state like deformation and other changes of state such as warming up due to frictional forces, and we'll continue to look at that. What we unfortunately won't have time to look at, because it's very complicated, is rotational motion. So because we're not concerned with rotation, or in other words, we ignore the orientation of objects through the rest of this course, we can ignore what part of an object a force acts on. The reason is that no matter where a force acts on an object, it has the same effect on the translational motion of the object. Where it acts only affects the rotational motion. So remember this picture from the very first lecture in the course. I talked about the particle model, and this is why we're going to be able to use the particle model. In particular, we're going to use the center of mass as representing the position of, of objects, because no matter where on an object a force acts, it has the same effect on the translational motion of the center of mass. We'll eventually look at systems where there are many forces acting on often sets of objects, and so we need clear notations to be able to distinguish between all these forces, and hopefully that notation should help us with identifying forces. So we might include in our notation what type of force we're talking about, and the agent and target of the force, because often when you have several forces they might be of the same type, and you need some other way of distinguishing them. Also, as usual, because as forces are vectors, we need to be able to indicate components. Here's the system I'm going to use for labeling my forces. You don't have to follow my system, but I'd suggest this is a pretty good one and you might consider it. So I'll always indicate a force with an F to tell you that it's a force. And in the superscript, I'll indicate what type of force it is, either contact or field. If it's a contact force, I'll just put a C, and that's for all contact forces. You may have met normal forces and spring forces and so on in various other courses, I'm not going to make those distinctions very much because, as we'll see, they're rather arbitrary and artificial distinctions. 
However, for field forces, I will distinguish between them. So I'll use a G for a gravitational force, which is the main field force we'll deal with in this course. But in Phys 1204, I'll often be using E for electrical force and so on. And it might seem strange to use a superscript because, you know, that's exponentiation. But we'll never have to take a force to a power. And so that superscript spot is just sitting there unused otherwise. Then I'll indicate the agent of the force in the subscript and the target of the force. And in both cases, I'll just always set up a labeling system if I can, so I can indicate each of those with a single letter. And often I'll leave something out if I don't need it. So for example, I'll often be writing down a bunch of forces that are all on the same target, and then I'll just leave off the on part of my notation. The vector sum of forces is the rate of change of momentum, and there are two ways for momentum to change. Either the velocity of something could change, or the inertia of something could change. We're going to focus on velocities of things changing. We're not going to look much at inertias changing, but that does happen, for example, in nuclear reactions, or if you're thinking about a rocket and not including the escaping gases in your system, then you have a system which has a reducing inertia. But we're going to focus on changing velocities, and in that case then the vector sum of forces is directly related to the rate of change of velocity. And we know what that is, that's the acceleration. So think of Unit 3 of the course, which was all about acceleration. And there we saw that if we know the initial position and initial velocity, we can use the acceleration to solve for everything that the object does after that. And so knowing all the forces and knowing the initial position and velocity of an object gives us enough information to predict everything about the future motion of that object. Now we come to how you actually draw your free body diagrams. This is a key skill. You're going to use it all over the place in other courses, and it's tricky. It takes practice to do it well. So first, choose the object that you're interested in. It's the thing that you think is moving somehow, or which for some other reason you're interested in. And if you have a diagram, you might put a circle or a box around it. And now is a good time to start establishing letters that you're going to use to represent objects. Now list all the objects that the object of interest interacts with. Perhaps start with the objects that it touches, establishing notation as you go, and then things that exert field forces on it. Next, identify all the forces on the object of interest by each listed object. I can't stress the importance of the word on enough. Don't list forces exerted by the object of interest. They don't affect this object. They affect other objects, and they'll just lead you to confusion, so ignore them. Next, draw a center of mass symbol to represent the object. Remember, we're thinking of the object as a point. It doesn't matter where on the object the forces act. It won't affect the translational motion, and so we don't want to be distracted by where on the object the forces act. So we'll represent it as a center of mass symbol. Now draw the force vector for each force that you've already identified and label it. Pay close attention to direction. If you know some force is bigger than another, you might as well draw it that way, but now isn't really the time to be worrying about how big these forces are. Just get them pointed in the right direction. And finally, somewhere near the diagram, indicate the direction that you think the object is accelerating. Or, if it's not accelerating, then say its acceleration is zero. Finally, it's a good idea to do a double check of agents and targets. If you're using the notation I'm using for forces, then the second subscript on every force should be its target, and they should all be the same. On your free body diagram, every force should have the object of interest as its target. If you find that by accident you've included a force where the object of interest is the agent, that doesn't belong here. That's a force exerted by the object, not on it, and it won't have any effect on the object's motion. So get rid of it. It doesn't belong here. 
I'm going to do a couple of examples to illustrate this process. So in this beautiful illustration you see a ring hanging by a cable and there's a person hanging from the ring with their feet not touching the floor. And let's draw a free body diagram for the ring. So there's our object of interest. It's the ring and I'm going to represent it by R. And now I'm going to list all the objects that interact with it. Well, it's touching the cable, and it's touching the person. And then presumably this is all happening on Earth, and so we're going to have a gravitational force due to the Earth. So now I'll just list the forces that each of these exerts, and that's pretty simple at this stage. We'll just have some contact force exerted by the cable on the ring and we will have some contact force exerted by the person on the ring, and we will have a gravitational force exerted by the Earth on the ring, and that should be all there is. So now I'll draw the free body diagram. So I'll draw my center of mass symbol, and the cable ought to be pulling up on the ring, And the person is certainly pulling down on the ring. And pretty much the definition of down is that it's the direction that gravity pulls. And note that this is the gravitational force on the ring. This is not the gravitational force on the person. That's a totally different force. It has no effect on the ring except that if there were no gravitational force on the person, you may realize that the person wouldn't be pulling down on the ring. And the only thing left is to indicate the acceleration. Everything's staying stationary here, and so the acceleration is zero. And I'll just do my double check that I have the ring, the ring, the ring, these are all forces on the ring, and so they do indeed belong on this free body diagram. Let's do another example. So here's a woman riding in an elevator, and the elevator is going up, and it's speeding up as it does so. And let's draw a free body diagram for the woman. So again, I'll start establishing notation. I'll use W to represent the woman. And what's she in contact with? Well, the only thing she's in contact with is the floor of the elevator. But of course, we also know that the Earth is going to exert a gravitational force on her. You might be tempted to think about the cable, right? After all, if the cable wasn't pulling up, the elevator and the woman wouldn't be going up and speeding up. But that's exerting a force on the elevator, not on the woman. So it will not exert any force that belongs on a free body diagram of the woman. So that's all our objects. So the floor will exert a contact force, floor on woman, and the earth will exert a gravitational force, Earth on woman, and this is going to be a very simple free body diagram because it only has those two forces on it. And now I need to put the acceleration. Now note, you need to take a viewpoint from an, in an inertial reference frame because you're going to use this to think about something that's equivalent to the law of inertia. So you've got to be in a reference frame where the inertia, law of inertia holds. So don't take the reference frame in the elevator where you could argue that the woman isn't accelerating. No, you want to take the viewpoint from outside the elevator and realize that if she is going up and speeding up, then her acceleration vector points up. And finally, I'll do my check. All of my forces are forces on the woman.